Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Lauren Izzo. And coming up in this edition, the Prime Minister leads the charge as Israelis line up to get dose number two of the COVID vaccine. The closure continues as police crack down on small business owners. <laughs> Israeli security forces are on a manhunt looking for the perpetrator of a car ramming attack. Okay, it's time for round two. Israel has officially kicked off its second round of COVID vaccinations, with the Prime Minister leading the way, as he did the first time around. Netanyahu receiving the second and final dose of his vaccination, with television cameras on hand to document it. את הפאבים, את המסעדות, את מכוני הכושר, את בתי הספר, בתי הכנסת, את התיאטרון, הכל. נעשה את זה באמצעות דרכון ירוק, אנחנו נפרט את זה בהמשך. אבל כדי שזה יקרה, אני צריך מכם, אזרחי ישראל, שני דברים. אני צריך שתיתנו כתף, כמובן לחיסון, והדבר השני, אני צריך שתיתנו כתף לסגר נגד המוטציות. ואנחנו עושים את זה יחד, נכנסנו יחד לקורונה, נצא ממנה יחד. By the way, those vaccinations that were set to arrive in Israel today did arrive in the last few hours. Also, yesterday, Israel's health minister, Yuli Edelstein, received a second dose as well, telling Israelis not to stop being careful, but also that there is finally a light at the end of the tunnel. Israel received its first shipment of the Pfizer vaccines in December and continues to lead the world in its vaccine campaign, having already inoculated nearly 2 million Israelis. 100,000 doses of the Moderna vaccines arrived in the country on Thursday and a million more from Pfizer today. I came to the Pfizer, Albert Burla, that we will be able אחד אחרי השני, ואנחנו נשלים את חיסונה של האוכלוסייה הבוגרת מעל גיל 16 בישראל במהלך חודש מרץ. היום אנחנו נמצאים עם למעלה מ-72% מבני 60 ומעלה שחוסנו, ואנחנו נשלים את זה. ביום ראשון הבא יבוא משלוח ענק נוסף, ואנחנו מתחילים בחיסונם של השכבה הבאה. בני חמישים ומעלה, חמישים עד שישים, וככה נתקדם. אנחנו סיכמנו, שר הבריאות ואנוכי, שאנחנו נתחיל לעלות היום, כבר היום, לקצב של 170 אלף חיסונים ביום. זה שיא עולמי. Netanyahu has said that the only way out of the current crisis is to simultaneously push the vaccination campaign and enforce a tight nationwide lockdown. If the country keeps with the momentum, Israel will have vaccinated all those eligible over the age of 16 by March, just in time for the election. While that vaccine campaign is going strong, cases are not on the decline. In fact, Israel's health ministry on Saturday saying that four instances of the new South African virus mutation have already been found in the country, all in patients who had recently traveled from South Africa. Also, not to mention the dozens of British mutations already found in the last weeks. According to health officials, the new variants could be behind the huge recent spike in cases. Let's find out the details from Professor Cyril Cohen, head of the Immunotherapy Laboratory at Bar Ilan University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So what do we know so far about the South African mutation? Is it more contagious than the British one? And what are the major differences between the British and South African variants? Yeah, so basically what we know about those two variants is that they are highly contagious, between 50 to 70 percent more contagious than what we know from the original, uh, uh, I would say, virus. Uh, basically, they share, both of them share the same mutation, which we call uh, 501, mutation 501. 
The other thing is that the, the South African uh, variant has two other mutations in what we call the spike protein. And we don't know right now the meaning of uh, those mutations, meaning the biological meaning. We do not foresee that those new variants can cause uh, a, a more severe disease. But on the other hand, we do know that it's spread uh, uh, much faster, and therefore, we have to be on the lookout. Is it possible that these uh, variants could be more contagious in children? Okay, so there is uh, this assumption uh, that was, I would say, uh, discussed uh, here and there. The idea behind that is that usually we believe that kids are less prone to uh, 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 infection because they express less receptors to the virus, meaning there are less points of entry for the virus to, to infect kids. But on the other hand, if on what we know, uh, in these variants, there is an increased affinity of the virus to our cells that might actually compensate, you know, the lack of receptors in kids. And therefore, it might be that that variant is perhaps a little bit more infectious in kids and teenagers, especially teenagers. Doctor, how confident are we that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are actually effective against these strains as well? So right now we have recent data from last week that clearly indicates that the, uh, uh, vac that the vaccine can protect from the British variant uh, and that you know, those mutations do not, I would say, uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, the recognition from people or the recognition by the immune system from people that were vaccinated regarding the uh, South African uh, uh, variant, there is some kind of, I would say, uh, uh, diver the divergent opinions, because on the one hand, uh, we do believe that the vaccine should be effective. The question is to what extent? So we believe it, it can range, I don't know, between 50% to 100% effective uh, against that new variant. My personal opinion is that the, va is that the vaccine can and will be efficient against the South African variant. Well, this could potentially be, you know, just the beginning of the mutations we're seeing. Is it possible that the science community will have to start from square one with vaccine research if the virus does mutate enough? Is that possible? Okay, so I wouldn't call that, you know, square one. I, I, I'm just going to say that, you know, what we know is that the corona family of, of viruses is quite stable, you know, in terms of genetically stable, okay? It doesn't mutate a lot. We also know that so far we have counted around thousands of different mutations uh, in those coronaviruses. The more people get infected, the more variants we will see. But on the other hand, I, I think that uh, if we really identify a new variant that will be, I would say, resistant to the vaccine, the technologies of Pfizer and Moderna actually allow uh, the uh, generation and the production of new vaccines that will give a protection for those new variants quite efficiently and quite quickly, you know, within weeks. You know, you will have to start the, the, uh, the production from the beginning. But on the other hand, I trust that uh, we will be able to generate new vaccines within a matter of I would say weeks to a few months. Now, the real question right now is the testing. We will have, do, do we have to test everything from the beginning, you know, phase one, phase two, or phase three, or can we rely on what was done for the original vaccine? And I think that we might opt for a scenario that is similar to what we have, for example, for flu. We do not test the vaccines every year, you know, when we make a new composition, a new, a new uh, vaccine, you know, for the current flu, but we rely on, on our past experience. And I think that that might be the option that we will choose right now with those variants if they are proven to be resistant to the current vaccine. Definitely lots of variables, so we will have to wait and see. Dr. Cyril Cohen, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you very much. So what are the latest numbers? Well, don't forget Saturdays in Israel are a national holiday, so far fewer tests are carried out on that day. But this Saturday, Israel's health ministry recorded 5,047 cases. The average daily infection rate this week has averaged more than around 7,000 daily.
So with just over 5,000 cases recorded on Saturday, that puts the country's positive infection rate at 6.3%. Also, the country's serious cases have surpassed 1,000 for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic. The official death toll now stands at 3,651 after another 62 patients passed away over the weekend. Israel currently has 69,000 active coronavirus patients. If you're curious how the virus is spreading across the country, take a look at these numbers. Jerusalem has by far the highest number of cases with more than 13,000, 10,000 more than any other city in the country. Tel Aviv with nearly 2,000 active cases and cities in the north like Tzfat and Tiberias with just a few hundred. Meanwhile, Israel continues to enforce a national lockdown which kicked off overnight Thursday. Thousands took to the beaches in Tel Aviv despite restrictions and police handed out fines. Officials are urging Israelis to follow the lockdown rules if the country is to return to normalcy anytime in the near future. Meanwhile, not everyone is following the restrictions. Business owners calling the rules unfair, saying they need to make money to survive. <laughs> Police arrested the owner of a falafel shop in the town of Shoham. The man said he was beaten and tased by officers who aggressively entered his shop. The man claiming he had not invited any customers inside the store only left the door open a crack while he prepared himself a sandwich. Still, officers entered the shop and gave the man a 5,000 shekel fine. In addition, they arrested the 50-year-old man and his 18-year-old son on accusations of assault after police said the men threw furniture at them. Really difficult scenes to look at. Now, according to the lockdown rules, restaurants are only allowed to serve food via delivery and takeout is forbidden as well. Many in the food industry have claimed the closures are destroying their businesses and the country is not providing enough compensation, so they're forced to break the rules. Well, despite new harsh lockdown restrictions, a massive turnout this weekend in Jerusalem for anti-Netanyahu protests. Thousands gathered outside the prime minister's residence in the country's capital to demonstrate against the government's reaction to the COVID crisis, as well as corruption charges against the prime minister. Cannot be the prime minister will be a prime minister when he was charged. He will do everything to delay his uh, sentence. He will take the people as a prisoner, and I can't accept it. This is why I'm here. Smaller demonstrations were also held in other locations around the country. Additionally, Israel's internal security agency, the Shin Bet, apparently hacked several protesters' phones on Saturday. According to local Israeli media, agents were granted authorization to read messages on demonstrators' phones and search their homes after they breached a police barricade outside the residential compound of the prime minister. Both Netanyahu and his wife, Sarah, were evacuated to a safe location. According to witnesses, protesters had no intention of breaking into the property. In response, the Shin Bet said it was acting in accordance with the law to safeguard the country's security, democratic governmental order, and institutions. If any threat of this type is identified, the Shin Bet will act in accordance with the tools at its disposal in accordance with the law. Israeli security forces are on a manhunt looking for the perpetrator of a car ramming attack and attempted shooting at a military checkpoint in the West Bank. According to the IDF, the soldier struck by the vehicle was not injured. Two people were allegedly in the vehicle near the town of Yabad when it accelerated toward troops after they finished inspecting another car nearby. One of the suspects tried to fire towards troops but dropped his gun, which troops then confiscated and then he fled the scene. Security forces are currently sweeping the area. Iran has new strategic missile bases on the shores of the Persian Gulf. According to local news reports, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps unveiling the new facilities in the country's southern region near the Strait of Hormuz. Top commander of the IRGC, General Hussein Salami, says that Iran's ability to defend itself is getting stronger, adding that this was just one of the, quote, several IRGC naval strategic missile facilities. 
The IRGC is designated by the United States as a terrorist organization. The comments and unveiling appeared to be part of a series of moves this week aimed at increasing Iran's leverage before Joe Biden becomes the U.S. president on January 20th. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department is calling out Iran for expelling United Nations nuclear watchdogs. While Donald Trump famously exited the GCPOA nuclear deal back in 2018, the inspectors served as a enforcers of international law, not necessarily of that deal. Iran's recent announcement that it has resumed 20% uranium enrichment, bringing them closer to a bomb, has caused its enemy countries to be cautious. The State Department is urging universal condemnation over Iran's expulsion of the international inspectors, calling them the world's top sponsors of terrorism. Okay, let's bring in Dr. Fadi Esmail into the conversation. He's a research fellow at the International Institute for Counterterrorism and at the IDC Herzliya. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, it looks like Iran is uh, flexing its muscles just before Biden takes over the White House. Aren't we expecting Biden to warm up to Iran a little bit and maybe re-enter the nuclear deal. So what is the strategy here with this last minute show of force? Are they afraid Trump could do something in his last days as president? Good evening. Uh, well, as far as uh, could Trump do something in his final days? Yeah, of course he could. Although uh, the probability for that, like if we're talking about a major military attack against Iran, is not very high probability. That's one thing. The other thing is about Mr. Biden and his ability to go back to the JCPOA, um, that will also be very difficult. Uh, and the reason for it is that the concerns that were, that were uh, uh, presented during the, the administration, the Trump administration, remain there. Issues of uh, ballistic missiles, issues of terrorism, issues of uh, Iran's uh, interference with uh, all political um, uh, aspects of very far outside its borders in the Middle East, even far outside of Middle East itself. It reaches South, South America and places like that. All those issues still remain. Uh, they haven't changed. And uh, therefore, the ability of uh, President Link Biden simply to uh, to U-turn back to where we were about six, seven years ago, that is, is nearly impossible. Um, also, another thing is um, uh, President-elect Biden more than once said that he is not going to be a third Obama administration. That's one thing. The other thing is he doesn't want to be a second uh, Trump administration. So what will he do? Uh, he will have to find uh, a way to uh, differentiate himself from both presidents, Obama and Trump, while maintaining American interests in the Middle East and uh, keeping Iran in check. It is not going to be an easy act to do, uh, but he will try for sure. Dr. Ismail, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you for having me. Have a great evening. Well, Israel is a global frontrunner of technology in agriculture. A special program in the country's south trains students from Southeast Asia so they can help their own communities flourish. Take a look. The Arava International Center for Agricultural Training trains over 1,200 students from Southeast Asia and Africa every year in cooperation with Tel Aviv University. Established in the central Arava town of Sapir, through the support of the Jewish National Fund USA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Agriculture, students gain an invaluable education in sustainable agricultural technologies and agronomics, which includes learning about Israeli innovation in one of the most challenging regions of the country. The fellows will work in close partnership with their mentors and be awarded funding based on mutually agreeable benchmark goals. Alumni have continued to share Israeli technology and innovations in order to create agronomic opportunities in their home countries, bringing sustainable agricultural practices, water management, aquaculture, and cutting-edge technological training that they learned in Israel. The program's goal is to turn Israeli innovation into a sustainable growth model that will impact the fellow's local community and continue to utilize Israeli technology and innovation to maximize Israel's global impact. And joining me now with more details is Hani Arnon, Executive Director of the Arava International Center for Agricultural Training. Thank you for joining us. 
Thank you. It's my pleasure to talk about the uh, ACAT program and share more details. It's our pleasure to have you. So how long have you been running this program and what organizations are involved in the Institute? Okay. Um, um, we actually, we established ACAT in 1994 with the support of the Israeli government, uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Agriculture, and we have other partners in the, for, in the origin countries of the students, uh, the embassies, the, the Israeli embassy, and, and also the universities and official uh, ministry. And, and in Israel, we also have, uh, as I said, the Israeli authorities. And we have friends that believe in our project and support friends like uh, the JNF USA and, and JNF in other countries. So speaking of the students in this program, uh, where are most of them from? Are any of them from countries that don't necessarily have diplomatic ties with Israel? Um, actually, we have a multitude of nationalities and cultures and religions, and they are coming, all of them, from developing countries. That The main source of livelihood is agriculture. And they come from, I, I give you some examples because it's exciting, um, they come from mainly in, from Asia and Africa, countries like Vietnam, um, Nepal, uh, Cambodia, East Timor, Fiji, Vanuatu, um, uh, Indonesia. As you know, Indonesia is a Muslim country that Israel doesn't have diplomatic ties. It doesn't matter, but these people, they choose agriculture and they choose to study this in Israel because the, Israel have a good name about uh, um, innovation in agriculture, about high technologies. And although they hear in the media, you know, they hear different things about Israel, they choose to come here and stay with us for a year to, uh, to study in a program that is based on learning by doing. It's theoretical classes, but also a practical. They get, they get the know-how in the farms and they are part of the community. Actually, they become a family of the people who lives in the Arabah. It's obviously been a very strange year for all of us. I'm wondering how has the pandemic affected your program? Yeah, actually it's very strange. They completed this, the program in June, but they couldn't go back. So they stuck here, stuck, but they are very happy for that. And they learn that it doesn't matter if it's a, a crisis or if it's a, a peaceful time, Every time and every country need food. People need to eat. So to be to work in agriculture, it's necessary. And especially if uh, if you are if it's a local uh, product, then you take care for the food security. I think the the pandemic uh, all over the world teach us that agriculture is necessary, and our students understand that they choose a, a topic or they they choose an occupation that maybe at the beginning it looks like a, it's dirty job, you know, work with hands, but they understand the meaning and the importance of the agriculture. Sounds like a really, really special program. Thank you so much for giving us some insight into this on our show today. Okay, thank you. Okay, on that note, it's time to take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be clear skies with temperatures around 52 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow, it's warming up a bit. We'll also have clear skies with temperatures at around 76 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius. And now, just before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. So for those of you who don't know, Volt is the food delivery company uh, that's uh, the most popular one in Tel Aviv. And it looks like a crane worker wanted to order some food because, of course, according to our lockdown, we can't actually go get food from restaurants. So we ordered a Volt delivery and the Volt delivery man came and delivered his food up the crane. Wow, that is amazing service. <laughs> All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.18 shekels to the American dollar and 2.51 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Then don't forget to visit the all-new and improved ILTV website at ILTV.tv and let us know what you think. Subscribe to our newsletter for the latest updates while you're there. I'm Lauren Izo. Thank you for watching.